traditional model actually in, in India. Only question can you mute? Then, ah, yeah. okay. okay, so uh, the, we are celebrating the National Moth Week. So, this is the uh, 10th year of the National Moth Week. So, basically, the National Moth Week is a, a, a in opportunity and a citizen science initiative to uh, spread awareness on moths okay. and it is also to record the moths moth diversity in different countries okay so even though it is known as the Na national moth week okay, so it is celebrating in uh, different countries so as uh, their own and the national moth week okay so this year, uh, uh, actually, it is uh, starting uh, from I mean, starting from 17th June, and it will be going up to 25th July. Okay, so this year the response from India is actually overwhelming. So we have uh, the yesterday's as for uh, the record. So we have around 900 plus event registration. Okay, so in from India alone. So that is huge. Okay, so the uh, a lot of people are watching modes. Lot of the students are taking in the uh, the lead to uh, watch modes and lot of researches and that lot of students are joining in the projects. Okay, so. And so why moths moths are the uh, the is the insects so they are diverse okay, and they are having uh, the uh, large population but uh, we, i mean the we know less uh, things about them so the we need to know more about moths okay, and their diversity and their importance in the ecosystem so we need to uh, create awareness regarding the moths uh, especially in the public and the uh, and also we need to um, do a lot of research uh, on moths okay so since it is a diverse uh, the uh, I mean, the uh, group okay and it is uh, having a lot of the uh, species actually in india it is uh, we have only around so the, um, 1100 or 200 species of uh, butterflies but uh, we expect uh, at least uh, 10 times more I mean, more the moths than the butterflies Okay. So the diversity is huge and most of them are up, up coming at night time. So we are not uh, the documenting them properly. So we are not uh, the getting a chance to study them properly. So I mean only if a handful of people cannot do this uh, uh, the, uh, the task of uh, uh, documenting and researching butterflies okay, or um, moths. So I mean we are going through the citizen science way. So where all the a citizen even the layman or students or the uh, the anybody can they uh, record moths and share it in some of the uh, in the city science for science forums okay. in, in in india this year in the uh, the three major the uh, the citizen science platforms like the i naturalist indian biodiversity portal and the moths of india are collaborating with this one so if you are observing moths uh, anywhere uh, in near in uh, near your area or anywhere so you can uh, record it so you can uh, just click it uh, and you can share it in any of this platform so where the experts will be getting the identifying them and it will be converted into a research grade data so that the uh, the even science and the humanity will be getting benefited from that so uh, that is the background of the national moth week so coming to the uh, today's uh, the talk okay, actually the uh, um, in concern with the national moth week celebration so various regional uh, groups are organizing different uh, events okay so actually this particular event is organizing from kerala so the national moth week kerala the sect is organizing this particular talk so in this to, um, in today's talk actually we have a, a young a, a, the moth enthusiast mr unikrishnan mp okay he he is actually a a degree student he is studying in the uh, pioneer college in the kanur district of kerala okay. and he has developed his uh, the interest towards moths from even from his, his schools okay. and the uh, later he I mean the he was uh, started learning about its uh, the in early stages then uh, he was mainly on the uh, a citizen science platform to learn more about it especially on the indian biodiversity portal and in the uh, uh, i naturalist as well as in the uh, indian modes so where he was helping the people to identify the identify their uh, the observations okay. and slowly he was uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, getting chance to uh, learn more about modes. Okay, so today he'll be uh, the uh, talking uh, about the uh, mimicry in modes. Okay, so the uh, in, in the uh, I welcome all the participants, all the uh, participants to this particular talk on the mimicry in modes. Okay. So the only one request, so you can uh, the mute your uh, audio and video for best, better bandwidth and to avoid any disturbance during the presentation. Okay. So we'll be giving chance for the questions or you can put the questions in the chat. So we'll be taking uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay. So uh, thank you for joining with in, in this evening. So thank you all the participants. Okay. So uh, over to Unikrishna. So you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hope I'm audible. Oh, you are audible. Sir? Okay, sir. So, so while talking on mimicry in modes, it's very hard to say that a particular mode is not resembling to something else. So, actually, these modes are resembling to all. So, if we uh, tell generally, it's very hard for us to compare and tell that this mode is not looking like something like that so so today i will be dealing with mimicry in modes so it's an exceptional uh, so while if you are looking at modes uh, mimicry is an ex exceptional part of this mode thing so many of us will be wonder wondering how is this mimicry possible and how how beautiful are many modes with this peculiar phenomenon of mimicry So these are the contents uh, of so generally what and all other things we are going to discuss. So at first we can discuss about mimicry and camouflage view modes, which we can't easily find them, find out them easily from the field and also the invisible modes and few of the modes which resemble twigs and leaves. And uh, then we can move on to mode and uh, wasp like modes and eyes to IDs. How can we identify a, a uh, few modes using their eye spots and Zyganidae family, which is known for the mimicry and the evolutionary battle. So, here you could see a particular mode. So, this is actually Sri Lankan Atlas mode. So, not the Atlas mode, the largest mode is not this. So, it is the Sri Lankan Atlas mode, and this particular mode is seen in South India as well as Sri Lanka. So, its distribution, its type locality is actually Sri Lanka. And if you look at the uh, species name Taprobanus, it actually came from the Greek word Taprobana, which the Greeks used to refer Sri Lanka in ancient periods. So that's the reason for the particular name, uh, Taprobanus. So I take as Taprobanus. So this mode, if we look at, you look at this particular mode, and we could see eye spots in the, uh, in the four wings as well as hind wings. So in the wings, we could see eye spots. Actually, these eye spots are an anti-predatory, so it's anti-predatory, so just to fear or fight uh, the predators, these eye spots are being used. That's the one way this mode gets escaped from the predators. Actually, this mode is getting escaped from the predators with these eye spots in their wings. Not only these eye spots, they have dual features. The next one is just look at their four wing apex. If we just look at their forming apex, we could see a snake-like markings. Actually, this is also to threaten the predators. So how beautifully these moods are mimicking the snakes. Just look at that apex region. So if we look at this apex region, a similar kind of uh, snake-like markings could be seen. And the predators must obviously get frightened by looking at this uh, uh, snake-like markings on the forming apex. So that is the typical example of a mimicry. Uh, in a mode. So while dealing with mimicry, so it's actually an evolved resemblance. It's actually an evolved resemblance. During the course of evolution, so mimicry is exhibited by various organisms. So that same mimicry is one such type of mimicry. So we may be familiar with many type of mimicries, especially bad same mimicry. It's seen in many butterflies. Say, for example, uh, in uh, common murmur butterfly, we may have seen mimicry, which mimics the, the common roses as well as uh, other rose butterflies. So such type of bad scene mimicry is seen in mainly butterflies. Then too, it's also seen in moths. 
and also Mullerian mimicry, which was uh, found by Fritz Miller, and that same mimicry was uh, discovered by Henry Bates and Ocha mimicry, which uh, is a type of mimicry in which uh, the mimicry is uh, dealing with uh, self mimicry, to be said. That is, uh, if a caterpillar is having an eye spot, uh, which is similar, it's actually it's a false eye spot, and that is Ocha mimicry. And acoustic mim mimicry, which dealing with uh, ultrasonic sound producing uh, modes as well as bats. It's an uh, evolutionary battle, we are saying that, of uh, bat as well as modes. So that is acoustic mimicry. So various type of mimicries are seen in these modes. So here we could just look on for a few of the examples where we could see mimicry. Here the top, at top, we could see cyclosia latipanus. So the cyclosia latipanus is actually uh, mimicking a glassy tiger butterfly. So this cyclosia papillonaris is the moth which is seen in North India, but in South India we could see cyclosia latipanus and they are mimicking a glassy tiger butterfly. Paranthica aglia, glassy tiger butterfly. They are beautifully mimicking the glassy tiger butterfly and we often may get confused whether that's a butterfly or that's a moth since they are day flyers and they belong to Zyganidae family. And this, I'm talking on this particular moth, this female, the female of this particular moth is mimicking this butterfly. Actually, male is uh, quite dark colored and these females are just like that of the glassy tiger butterfly and they are also day flyers just like the butterflies. So here is another example. So here is another example of mimicry being exhibited in moths. So at down, you could see Hystia. Hystia is a, another moth in the Zyganidae family. So in this Hystia mode too, we could clearly see mimicry. So it's mimicking common rose butterfly. So this Hystia mode is actually mimicking common rose butterfly. Actually, they have dual advantage. One thing is that this Zyganidae family members, that is the moths in Zyganidae family, they have hydrogen cyanide in them. So actually the predators won't eat them, Zyganidae family members, and majority of them um, are day flyers. So these predators usually avoid these Zyganidae family members. And that's the first advantage. Another, ex uh, another advantage is they're mimicking this type of butterflies, day flying uh, moths uh, are mimicking these butterflies, uh, say for example, common rose, and they have dual advantage. First one is hydrogen cyanide, production and the predators would avoid them and the second one is mimicking such butterflies. So here is another example of Macrobrochus gigas is possibly in relationship, mimicry relationship with Eterosia edia that too in Zyganidae family. Macrobrochus gigas is a common moth and it's seen in Arabidae family and this moth too mimic Eterosia edia which is belonging to Zyganidae. Candidate for me. Only possibilities are here. So now here, you would see two pictures. The first one here on the left is Irrevocable Fairies. So just look at this particular mode. It's just like a smiling face. You could see a white band which is being curved and just like a smiling face with two eyes, very prominent two eyes we could see here and also a white band which is just like a smiling face and the common name is smiling face mode. So this Erebus Ephesaris is one of the most beautiful moths I had ever seen and they are belonging to Arabidae family. And this moth, uh, there is no uh, sexual dimorphism in this Erebus Ephesaris. And moving on to the next moth, it is Erebus macrops. So what is the meaning of word macro? Macro means something which is large and ox stands for eyes. So the meaning of this species, the species name reveals they have large eyes. That's the particular reason for the species name as Erebus macrobes, and their common name is common almoth. So these two species of almoth doesn't exhibit uh, such a variant sexual dimorphism. So we cannot see in sexual dimorphism in Erebus ephesperis and Erebus macrobes. So just when we move to Erebus hieroglyphica and Erebus camprimulgus, we could see sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism is very well 
evident in these particular modes, in these two modes. So very beautifully, we could see the ice spots on the pore wings. Along with that, uh, there are whitish markings in Erebus hieroglyphica. So just we could just look upon this. Uh, this uh, at the right side, we could see their illustration. So just look at their illustration. We could see how to. We could see uh, a whitish band. Uh, sorry, the whitish streaks are very much prominent on the left side. So in the case of Erebus hieroglyphica, so the whitish marks are very prominent in the left part and on the right picture only there is a whitish band, just a whitish marking. The other regions are fully black. So that's how we could distinguish Erebus hieroglyphica, females as well as males. So just look at this illustration closely. So on the left there is a female and on the right there is a male. So in the female there are white streaks and in the male only a single white band is seen. So that's how we could distinguish Erebus hieroglyphica. So moving on to Erebus caprimogus. So in Erebus caprimogus too there are whitish markings and very much different from Erebus hieroglyphica and they too exhibit sexual dimorphism and the one particular thing we could just look upon to distinguish this particular mode is the the males are completely black whereas the females we could see some uh, whitey streaks there so that's how we could distinguish rebus caprimogus so these two are just saying how to we could distinguish based on the rice spots and all so not only them not only the owl moths there are many other species which exhibits eye spots on their wings so the the false eye spots actually these are false eye spots not true eyes so here you could see Angicarcia irrorata. So it's an angry face. Just looking onto them, we would, uh, we would be scared, just like an angry face it is. So on the next, we could see Spirama species. That too, just smiling while looking at us. Just uh, We could just resemble to a smiling face in Spirama species too. And in Bastilla species, Bastilla cramiri, the eye spots are not on the four wings. Actually, the eye spots are on the near to the terminal region of uh, hind wings actually. So just uh, to confuse the predator where the head is, where the head is actually located. Here, it, the, here we could see the eye spots on the hind wings near to the termin region. So when the predator come close to this, they may get confused and they will think that uh, the, the region near to the hind wing is their head and they will pluck the eyes. So they will get confused and this uh, moon could easily escape from that predator, say for example birds. And not only in this, many other species too, we could see this type of eye markings. Uh, for example, Cyclodesoma, Spingomorpha, Chloria, and Spiridonia Obscura, and all, we could see this particular type of eye markings. And there, in Spiridonia, just look how beautifully it's glowing color, glowing such type of eye markings. So now we could just look upon the beauties. They are actually the beauties, the Saturnidae family members. So we may have often heard that moths are not brightly colored. They are just dull colored. Butterflies are very beautiful and butterflies are very brightly colored indeed. But no, it's not true actually. So there are many moths, they are brightly colored. So there are many moths which are very brightly colored and very beautiful too. Here is one such, Actian Selene. So moon moth actually, we call them in English, moon moth. So Actian Selene, so just uh, there are many eye spots in their four wings as well as hind wings respectively and there are eye spots which resembles to the moon that's why the name came moon moth so it's known as the indian moon moth actia selene so they are very beautiful in teeth and the next one is actia skeralana that's the particular moth we could see here in kerala as well as karnataka uh, previously this was listed in actia menias but now currently it's in the species the this type of species, Actia species, in Karnataka as well as Kerala is Actia skerlana. Previously it was Actia menias. They too are very beautiful to see uh, with their uh, yellowish wings with these reddish patches and their elongated tails. And the uh, one in town is Loipa species. So in South India only one species have been described that is Loipa skindle mystery. And this Loipa species are too very beautiful to see. And their name is, common name is 
uh, golden emperor mode so they have been called as emperors golden emperor mode so because of their beauty is such their name have came so just if we look uh, they are to have eye markings so a bad sim mimicry so bad sim mimicry is seen here so the predator must think something else this is not a mode by looking at their eyes the predators may think this is not a mode it's something else and if uh, and the predator may get threatened or may get confused and they may avoid them so the next is curricula that too uh, just not eye markings are not very, very much clear then too they are comma flash so comma flash is very well seen in them because of their particular colors uh, the reddish as well as brownish colors curricula is also seen in this particular species uh, they are all belonging to saturnidae family and anthria papia so in this mode too the tussle silk mode the anthria papia is tussle silk mode and in tussle silk mode too we could see this type of eye spots eye markings and they are very much used in tussle silk production and the saturnidae members one interesting thing is that uh, which uh, which is common this not very common in other moths and butterflies is that they are non feeding there are many moth families which are non feeding then too the saturnidae uh, family members are the most famous members uh, known for non feeding so here is one particular moth uh, greater death's head hawk moth acrocontia lachesis so Many of us may have thought about how the name Death's Head came in this particular moth. So just look at the thorax region. We could see a human skull. So that's the reason for the name uh, Death's Head Hawk moth. Just a human skull could be evidently seen from the thorax region. That's the reason for uh, the Death's Head in the Death's Head Hawk moth. So they are actually a hawk moth, and they belong to Spinchidae family. And uh, an interesting thing is that. they are very fond of honey and they often seen bee hives so they are also known as bee robber since they are uh, since they are uh, mainly seen near to uh, this uh, bee hives and all that's the reason for uh, the name bee robber for this particular species so i think many of you may have seen uh, dr roger kentrick series on moths uh, recently so in the third series of moths uh, uh, video uh, he had done Uh, on the survival so and mimicry as well was very well explained in that video and he had explained very well explained about this moth acrocontia lachesis uh, so it was explained as uh, five in one strategies so this moth exhibit five strategies for escaping from predators for escaping from predators uh, there are five strategies in this moth first one just thorax region just if you look at the thorax region it's not it's threatening for the predators just because of the skull like markings it's threatening for the predators that's the very first reason another reason is their wings and their wings are camouflaged so that's the second reason and the third one was uh, just look at the if we just look at the hind wings so i haven't included an image so if you look at their hind wing their hind wings are brightly colored and that's the another reason and they are often uh, they are often making click sound sounds squeaks squeaks they are also making squeaks so that's also a, a, a uh, that's also a strategy used in them to avoid predators and also when we look this uh, the first image the acrocontia lachesis which is named in down of that particular image if you look this most up, uh, upside down it's just like a bee and they do smell like a bee and they do behave like a bee that's also a strategy in this particular mode if you wish you can visit that video uh, by dr roger kendrick i hope you may have seen that so these are all beautiful moths just look at their thorax region they are smiling at us smiling moths actually tinolius uh, pangora and limantria marginata and they are all smiling moths how beautifully it has been exhibited on their thorax region in many moths uh, in the wings too this type of images are very well seen so that's the mimicry in this moths and in some moths uh, we can't see any perfect mimicry it must be an incomplete mimicry so during the course of evolution even it may get perfect during the course of evolution we could say that that imperfect mimicries 
So I just wondered how beautifully this moth have been exhibited the mimicry. Just look at the eyebrows, the eyes, the mustache, just like a human face. Trishkali Sabarana. It's wonderful to see this moth, uh, just the eyebrows, the eyes and the mustache, just like a human face. They have evolved much before the humans have. That's the peculiar thing. I just wondered how is this mimicry being seen in these moths. And the next one is Biston. Biston surface area. And they belong to Geometry family. And they are also one of the very best examples of camouflage. And here uh, you could see my wall. Uh, so the color of the wall is we could see some yellowish patches over there. And these moths too have this yellow color patch and they are being camouflaged and it's not an easy task for us to identify this mode at a at a very instant we need a closer look of this particular species to get easily identified so here are a few modes few brightly colored underwings so why are these modes having this brightly colored underwing this aposmatic colors so i just wonder about that so actually this is just one predator. So if you see, if you look at these moths, the wings are just like leaves. So if you look at these moths, the wings are just like leaves, dry leaves actually. So their hind wings are brightly colored. And when they are in rusting, in rusting position, uh, just look at Tian's Hornester, the image of Tian's Hornester, just look at that. So you could find that the hind wings are often closed while they rust. The Four wings hide the hind wings. The four wings are just like that of leaves, dry leaves actually, and uh, they hide the hind wings, brightly colored hind wings. So at the moment when the predator reach or they are being threatened or being warned, these moths will expose their hind wings, their brightly colored hind wings, and at first glance it swells. The predator may get distracted or may get threatened or frightened and move away and avoid these type of moths. So these are mainly seen in Arabidae family. The underwings are seen in Arabidae family mainly. Uh, Thias coronata and Thias honesta eudosima, the fruit piercing moths. It's very well seen. The underwings are very well seen in this uh, uh, eudosima species, uh, the fruit piercing moths. And Philodus consabrina, that too is a very beautiful moth. Just if you look at the brightish color on their hind wings, very beautiful to see. And just look at their four wings, it's just like a leaf. The very term genus Philodus means uh, leaves. So the Philodus term indicates leaf. So the four wings are just resembling uh, to that of a leaf. That's the very reason for the term Philodus. So Philodus consabrina. So not only that, not only the bright underwings, there are many modes that mimic leaves too. So we could see many modes, so which are mimicking leaves. So it's not an easy task for us to identify many modes in field. So if we just look at uh, any particular species for looking onto a specific species, they can't get easily, uh, they, we can't easily find them out in the field. So here are a few of that modes, which we can't easily find. So the first one here is gastropatcher species. So this gastropatcher species belong to Lesiocampida family and they are a brilliant example how a leaf is being mimicked by a moth. So gastropatcher species is one of the best example I would say how a moth is mimicking a leaf. And the next one is Euthrix laeta. That too is uh, mimicking the leaf. Just see the fungal patches over there in the Euthrix laeta. This species too mimics the leaves and they are also belonging to the Lesiocampidae family. And the third one here is Caria angulata and they belong to Nolidae family, actually Nolidae family. And their caterpillars are very well, um, many of us may have seen their caterpillars. They first had Nolid moth caterpillars. So Caria angulata and their wings, just see, we can't easily find them, the Caria angulata when they are sitting on a leaf and all. So just the camouflage have been brilliantly exhibited by their wings. So just move on to origin species. This origin species, uh, they belong to Japanidae family. Origin species are seen in Japanidae family, the hook tick moths actually. And there are many species in that group, uh, which just resembles that of dry leaves. Origin species is here. 
And the next one is beautiful Eudocimus laminia. You could see the beautiful Eudocimus laminia. The four wings are just like uh, green leaves, the greenish leaves. So we can't easily spot them if they are seen on any green leaves. So Eudocimus laminia and they're brightly colored underwings. Uh, I had mentioned previously why these underwings are colored, hind wings are brightly colored. So it's very beautiful to see them. So Amphilodus con Sabrina, this is the posture when their hind wings are being uh, heighted uh, by the four wings. So Philodus con Sabrina is here. So there are many modes that mimics leaves actually. So not only these, there are many such modes which do mimic leaves. So here is the spin sheet modes. The images are from months of India website. And here you could see Teratranesus, a hot mod. So Teratranesus. This is mimicking uh, a green. So it's an intermediate stage of leaf, which a leaf is uh, a dry leaf as well as a green leaf. It's an, it's in an intermediate stage, as well as Pergasa actus too. And Daphne Sneary, you could see uh, Daphne Sneary. That's one of the mostly seen modes here in your in our area. And also in iNaturalist too, these modes are very widely seen. Daphne Sneary, the oleander hop moth. And the caterpillars are seen in this uh, Nerium oleander. That's the particular reason for the uh, species name Neri, Nerium oleander that came from Nerium oleander. So we could see here Daphne's Neri. That too is a brilliant example of comma flash. So not only the wing color, then too, you could see an eye markings on the basal region of four wings, the starting of four wings. So just near to the thorax region, uh, you could see the eye sports. So that's also very wonderful to see how these modes are being mimicked or the, these modes are mimicking uh, the leaves. So down you could see Eudocima hypermestra, it's female actually. So the fungal patches are very well exhibited in the four wings and Eudocima orangea and that too some greenish patches are seen uh, and Trabala Vishnu. So actually in Trabala Vishnu, uh, the Male moths are very greenish and nothing else, just green color, greenish in nature, this Trabala Vishnu. And its females are yellowish in color and some just like uh, brownish patches are too seen in this particular moths female. So actually, uh, just if you look at Trabala Vishnu, it's quite interesting to see their hind wings being at top and four wings are down. Usually in case of many moths, four wings are seen in the uh, up region. So four wings are often seen uh, on the up region and the uh, uh, hind wings are often enclosed inside the four wings. But instead, here is an exception where Trabla Vishnu, here we could see the hind wings, dominant than the four wings. So these are the green modes, the emerald modes, because of the particular color, greenish color. These modes are known as emerald modes and they belong to geometry day family. Actually, geometry day family and geometry subfamily. So the majority members included in geometry subfamily are greenish color, green color. That's the very reason. Uh, so since the, they are having greenish color, uh, they are known as emerald modes, emerald modes. The reason for the term emerald is nothing but uh, their wing color, emerald modes. So here first is Aporantria specularia, a very common uh, geometric mode and emerald mode and agathia hemitheria. Agathia is also very common and not an easy to identify to uh, these emerald modes, uh, especially agathia, few species of agathia. And Enospila flavifu satan, that too is a beautiful mode uh, on the daytime while when they are uh, resting. They would often rest in some places like green leaves. So the predators can't find them easily. They are hiding inside the green leaves. First thing is that they are hiding, the majority of them are hiding on the underside of leaves. And the second one is that whenever a bird or another predator finds them, they can't easily spot them because of the color. And the next one is Komibayana Kasidara, that too is also uh, a common mod. Uh, not too common, but here uh, near to me, it's uh, quite common. And Hemithia species, many of us may have seen this Hemithia species because of their devil's face in the abdomen. Just look at their abdomen, just zoom and look at the abdomen. So near to the abdomen, you could see a devil's face. So that that's one of the strategy in moth. And the second strategy is the, uh, the wings, which is greenish in color. So dual strategies are seen in this moth too. So then Cyclothea and Disjuncta, this too is a common geometry moth. 
uh, geometry as a family member, the emerald mode and the green modes are here. So there are, an, there are many invisible modes too, not only uh, mimicking the background, there, many modes are transparent wings. So uh, you could see first one is of Stramohedra species, uh, Crambidae family member, so this Stramohedra species you could see here, and that's in underside of the leaf, they are rusting, and they are too not easy to find them because of their transparency in their wings. On the right side at top, you could see Arctone species. This Arctone species too have uh, transparent wings. So when we just look at their wings, uh, just their background is being seen and we can't easily spot them. So at down, you could see Cariola species, just down of the Arctone species, you could see Cariola species. That too is a wonderful example of how it's being uh, so actually the background image is seen in this mode swings. We can't see actually patch color or any pattern at first sight of this particular mode. So Cariola, uh, Cariola Fenestrator to be precise, we could see here. So these are the invisible modes. So there are many modes which do mimic the twigs. So at first sight, we may think that these are all, these are all are twigs. But not actually, it is actually moons, not twigs. So first one here is Palira species, which belong to Notodontidae family. So it's very interesting to see how this uh, mimicking this, uh, these twigs and all. Uh, and the next one is Acropis Burmitra, the Geometry Day family member. It's actually a looper moon, and you cannot see any legs on the middle portion, on the abdominal segments and all, just uh, down you could see uh, uh, legs. So actually, these are all mimicking twigs. So for the predators, they are all just twigs, not caterpillars, not moths, just for us too, on the first glance, we may also think these are not moths, these are actually ticks and all. So Falira species is here, and Hectropis burmitra is here, and Bistron species. So here you could see a triangle. So in this Bistron species, you could see a triangle. So which is the moth? We may get confused at first, where is the moth actually located? So the three, uh, three lines are actually just there. At first sight, if I'm saying there's a caterpillar in these three angles, so three lines, that's a triangle. So many of us want, at first sight, they, we, need to, uh, we need to have a deeper look onto it. Then only we could find where the caterpillar actually is. So that's the case of Bistron species that who belong to Geometridae family. So, there is a psychidae here. So this psychidae member, they are, uh, these two are also most very commonly seen moths. Psychidae, they are also known as bagworm moths. So the caterpillars make their houses, very beautiful houses in tea, uh, using these caterpillar, uh, using these twigs actually. So when they are uh, making these twigs, uh, use, uh, the caterpillars are making these twigs, and we can't actually know that that's actually a moth or as a caterpillar. We may just think that that's actually a twig. But actually, it's not. It's actually a psychidae member, a bagworm moth, which belong to psychidae family, bagworm moths. So there are a few moths which do mimic bird poop, actually. First one here is Tonica nivifarana and Aconsia species, and the expert in bird poop mimicking, uh, macrocytic species. So they're just beautiful to see. Uh, just how brilliantly they are mimicking the bird group, bird droppings. Actually, I'm not telling you that uh, there are many moths which are mimicking these bird droppings, and I'm not telling you to go and found and just look at and look, look and search for bird droppings and all. Not just like that, but there are many moths which do mimic these bird droppings and all. So actually, this just like us too. The birds don't like to uh, move just to their droppings. So that's the very thing seen here. Uh, in this microcilix, they have added advantage. We could see some flies which are getting attracted to these bird droppings too. So these are all very interesting things you could find in this moth world. So Tonica is the Aconcia species. So this actual Aconcia species is known as a bird dropping moth actually. So Aconcia species is here. So and also the uh, bird dropping mimicry expert. We could say as like that. So so macrocilix is there. So here is the hummingbird hawk moth, the macroglossum species. So on the left, there we could see a hummingbird hawk moth, and on the right side, we could see a hummingbird. 
So they are actually quite similar in flight. This hummingbird cock moth, as well as the hummingbird, is quite similar in flight. So the genus name of hummingbird cock moth is actually Macroglossum. So macro means something which is very large, and glossum means tongue. So the name refers to their particular type of proboscis, which is long projected. So that's a very reason for the genus name uh, Macroglossum. So they are known as hummingbird hawk moths. So actually, these hummingbird hawk moths are not seen in India nor Kerala. So actually, uh, they are mimicking this moth. So sorry, this moth is mimicking hummingbird. Not to say hummingbird, then to we have sunbirds, which are quite similar to hummingbirds. They are actually mimicking this type of birds, and the larger birds may think that this is actually a bird, not a moth, and and also many other predators, small predators may too think that this is a bird. So they would possibly avoid this type of moths. And this hummingbird hawk moth uh, is migratory in nature. Many species are known to be migratory too. So they are beautifully mimicking these hummingbirds. So the, and they are a J flyer too. And they have a significant part in pollination. So while talking on pollination, many moths have a significant role just after honeybees. So they have a significant role in pollination too. So here is a moth, or a butterfly is it? Tetragonus catamitis. So just looking onto it, we have heard that uh, butterflies, uh, during, uh, while they are resting, these butterflies, while they are resting, they will keep their wings lifted and moths will keep their wings flat. But this is not true always, there are exceptions. So one such exception is this particular moth. This is actually butterfly moth, which belong to Cali Julidae family. So the Calidulidae family members. So here in South India, especially in Kerala, we could see this particular species, uh, Tetragonus catamitis or the butterfly moth. So they are very beautiful to see indeed because we may not think that it's a moth at first sight. So we may think that it's a butterfly, but actually it's not, it's a moth. So its common name is butterfly moth because of the peculiar day flying nature as well as their resting posture, which do look similar to the butterflies. But actually, it's a moth belonging to Calidulidae family, and they are well mimicking the butterflies. So here are a few clear wings. So Cecidae members, the first two are Cecidae members, uh, Melitia species and Cynatheron species. Uh, they both belong to Cecidae family, and they are very well mimicking these uh, bees or rats, to say. Uh, so Melitia species. So they are wonderful to see. Uh, how they are mimicking these bees and synaptodon, they are clear wing uh, moths and they are too mimicking the wasp. So, the Saphonoda silas, the spinched moth, they belong to Sphinchidae family, Saphonoda silas. So, the spinched moth, Saphonoda silas, is too mimicking the bees to be safe. So, these are all uh, very beautiful to see indeed, actually, uh, these moths. Uh, we can't easily find with some moth and with some wasp at first sight. Actually, we need to have a closer look into it, then too, then only we could find which actually it is. So, not only uh, the birds, the moths are not mimicking the birds, the bird dropping, the twigs, the leaves, and not like that. There are many moths which do mimic the spiders. There are many spider mimicking moths. So, here is one such, uh, some, uh, one such example. So here you could see Coriotidae family members, Coriotidae family members, Brenthia species is being, uh, in the photographs, uh, we could see Brenthia species, also a Coriotidae species, uh, which that, uh, that's the orange moth here is Coriotidae species, rest all are Brenthia species. So you could see the marking similar to a jumping spider, just similar to that of a jumping spider. If you see on the image on the right side, we could see clearly see how the markings are well uh, depicted on this image of uh, the Coriotis, on the wings of this Coriotis species. Just uh, if we are looking, the legs are very clearly depicted, even the eyes too. Don't, don't, we no need to count the number of eyes. Actually, uh, nothing eyes. So actually, we no need to count the eyes. How many eyes are they have? So in the Brindia moth especially, uh, we no need to count the number of eyes. Actually, they are mimicking. Just look at their legs too. Uh, just in the exact position of a jumping spider, we could see markings. So not only in the wing markings, their uh, movement too, they are mimicking jumping spiders. That's an interesting fact. Because uh, when these species need to move from one place to another, 
apart from flying in short distances they will jump each other so jump they will jump actually just similar to that of uh, jumping spiders this creative day family members especially this brentia species they, they do jump from one place to short distance actually not a longer distance they actually jump just like jumping spider very well mimicked by uh, very well mimicked the spider is very well mimicked by this uh, brentia species to be said so here is another example of an asentropinia subfamily member of the crabidae family here you could see a spider on the right side on the left side we could see a moth uh, which is belonging to asentropinia subfamily of the crabidae family it's actually nymphicola trimacula also just like a jumping spider the eye spots are very pro predominant very dominant eye spots are here just like that of uh, the uh, jumping spiders and also the legs just look upon their legs just similar to a similar pattern of a jumping spider leg so they don't have uh, the jumping behavior just uh, like that of brentia species and the coryidae then too this moth have markings similar to that of jumping spider and we could say that this moth is obviously mimicking the jumping spider so this nymphicola species actually this asentropinia family members most of the caterpillars are aquatic caterpillars not uh, the caterpillars just we would uh, say that they would eat leaves not like that many caterpillars are aquatic too for example here it is nymphicola trimacula trimacula means we could see three spot here that's very recent for the species name uh, trimacula and also we could see here a jumping spider too so they are very well mimicking uh, the jumping spider so here is an interesting thing so just look into it here it's a homodes bracticuta uh, another moth and just see the caterpillar just like ants how the ants move in a line just like that uh, the caterpillar is also mimic this ants so a number of ants which is moving in a line and they have projections which uh, which is very similar to that of a ant too they have projections too on the lateral sides just look at they are lateral sides they have projections uh, just like the legs of these ants so this uh, weaver ants just look at the weaver ants they are quite similar indeed and they we could say that uh, many species are mimicking these ants to the ants which move in a particular line so why do they mimic ants actually the reason is uh, we all know that ants produce uh, formic acids and pre predators usually doesn't want to get a bite from them so the predators would mostly avoid these type of caterpillars Uh, caterpillars by thinking that it's actually an ant but no it actually it's not an ant then to the predators may think just like birds will think that it's a caterpillar not a caterpillar just a line of ants so they will avoid so here is one such example uh, homodes bracticata so here is quite interesting two moths here is a moth uh, from balakrishnan malapilsa's life cycle uh, here its name is jonda uriclora so just like a toads image is being depicted on their wings we know that the toads are having a uh, warty glands as well as parotid glands so usually the predators want uh, would avoid these toads actually uh, these predators would avoid these toads by thinking of about their secretions so such like that i think this moth is also mimicking uh, their image of a toad because uh, because many predators would avoid these toads while thinking of their what is secretions what is uh, glands secretions from the parotid uh, glands as well as uh, what is uh, glands so actually this donda uriclora it's actually amazing to see this particular moth so and the next one is cicada species and if we have a deep look at this cicada species is just like a praying mantis if we have seen praying mantis many times so who and all have seen this particular type of moth i haven't seen this moth actually so this is mantis mimicking moth cicada species so very beautifully they are mimicking the mantis uh, so their fore uh, so the front legs just lifted up like uh, that of a mantis cicada species a mantis mimicking moth so there are numerous number of bass moths Uh, uh, at initially, I had said that we could just look upon uh, a moth or a wasp. This is actually moths. So, Amanta saizia, they are belonging to Cinctomini tribe, and the Euchromia polymena, the brightly colored uh, Euchromia polymena, belong to Actini family and uh, Actini tribe. I think so. So, they are very beautiful to see. How beautifully we could see these moths, the Euchromia polymena, especially the day-flying moths. 
So all these bias modes, where say whether example say uh, MHS ICR, Sintomoides in Marron, MHR Pasalis, Eurysia Confinus, Euchromia Polymena, these all are J flyers, just like VASP. So just like VASP, they are J flyers too, and many of the predators would avoid them, and the predators may think that these are not modes, they are actually VASP, and nobody would think of getting a bite from VASP, so they usually avoid them. So we could just look upon identifying a few caterpillars, uh, a few, few caterpillars just looking their eye spots. We could identify. So there are many common caterpillars in our surroundings, and we could do identify many caterpillars just by looking their eye spots. So eye spots, we could consider eye spot as an IDK tool. So here at first, uh, you could see Daphne Sneary, the Oleander Hawk mode. So the caterpillar is seen above, and there are adults. The adults of respective caterpillars are seen down. So Japanese sneery is seen. So the, the eye markings are very catchy. So the eye, eye markings, the eye spot is having a bluish color. So growing bluish color actually. So if we have seen any caterpillar which is having this type of eye spot, then we could confirm that it's Japanese sneery. And the second one is Perges actius. So Perges actius caterpillars uh, we could see, so this is actually a brown form of Perges actius. So I had to wear this caterpillar. So it is having two forms. In, it's seen in green form as well as it's seen in brown form. And this is actually brown form. And in this caterpillar, if we look deep or closely, uh, it's quite different from that of the Daphne sneery. The caterpillar of Daphne sneery is very much different from that of Perges actius. If we just look on to their eye spot, and we could see a particular line from the end of the eye spots towards the uh, head region. So this is actually an initial uh, abdominal uh, segment. So these eye spots are seen in initial abdominal segments actually. And the towards the thorax or head region, we could see a line from uh, this fall size. So that's a key to distinguish Perkins actius. And the adult is seen here, or down, you could see the adult. And the third mode here is Tretra Lucasi. So this moth, caterpillar, if we look at this caterpillar of this particular moth, and they are very different from the mentioned, above mentioned too, uh, the later mentioned too. So just if we look at their eye spot, uh, we could see a dark color at the beginning, then later we could see a maroon color, then later a white border is seen. So these are unique to Tretra Lucasi caterpillars. So we could easily distinguish the caterpillars of Tretra Lucasi if we have a chance, if we get a chance to come across this caterpillar. So the next one is Teretra Clotho. Their adults are quite similar, but then to the caterpillars are very much different. So actually, uh, we could easily distinguish Teretra Lucasi and Teretra Clotho with the uh, lines, actually. So Teretra Lucasi has many lines on the forewing patch, and also the darker patch in the medial region of the forewing is quite uh, darker uh, when comparing to Teretra Clotho. So we could distinguish that to Teretra Lucasi and Teretra Clotho. And just look at the caterpillar of Teretra Clotho. It is very different. Uh, and there is, at the center, there is a white color, I think so. Sorry. Uh, there's a greenish color, I think so. And uh, it's covered with a green ring, then right later, a yellowish ring. So that too is uh, unique to this particular caterpillar, Teretra Clotho. And just if we move on to look at Teretra Palicosta, these are all spinchet modes, actually. These modes. Uh, the eyes to IDs are for identification of spin sheet caterpillars which are having uh, these small size spots. So, uh, if we just look at Tretra palicosta, we could see an eye spot. Sorry that I had included, I haven't zoomed the image. So, if we look at the net 2, you could find many caterpillars of Tretra palicosta. So, if we just zoom the image, you could see the uh, eye spot, the full size spots, and these are very much different from the other caterpillars. So we could easily identify these caterpillars, these all caterpillars from the eyes, the false eye spots. That's where we could identify the caterpillars from eyes. So here is the next batch. So the first is first here is Hippoton celerio. So that too is very much different. Uh, because of their, uh, so at center there is greenish color and pure spots, why uh, yellowish spots are in that and it's outlined, it's being outlined by a yellowish ring. So, and also 
uh, near to that only a single spot is seen apart from this false eye spot only a single spot is seen but the next one uh, hippodian species it could be either hippodian rosetta or hippodian boravii actually this particular species of hippodian rosetta boravii they are often confusing we can't easily identify them uh, we need hind wing for better clarification so it's the caterpillar here is of uh, hippodian uh, hippodian species it could be either rosetta or it could be boravii so i could confirm the caterpillar here is uh, hippodian rosetta since i have taken the image from spinchery of eastern paleoratic one of the best websites you can refer for spinchit ids and the next one here is thraetranesus so their caterpillar too have eye spots which are quite different from others so we could easily identify thraetranesus from others especially the caterpillar and the next is thraetra lysitas the fourth one here is thraetra lysitas so just look at the image they two are quite different from the other caterpillars mentioned here and if we just look at them they have in the center part they are having a dark patch and it's outlined outlined uh, by a yellow string and there are series of spots but then too we can closely look upon their eye spots on the uh, beginning of their abdominal segment so they are also very easy to distinguish and at last we could see thraetra olgen landsdale and this month uh, thraetra olgen landsdale is two very much different so they are having many spots i similar eye spots are full distributed on their body and also we could easily find them so easy to distinguish this particular moth thraetra olgen landsdale mm -hmm. so the eye spots in eudosima species so in the illustration here uh, it there is three species here in the illustration at first you could see the the first illustration here is of uh, eudosima hypernestra and the second illustration is of uh, eudosima uh, falonia and the third illustration is of eudosima homaena and the eudosima homaena images that is the images not the illustration are seen here so i have taken the illustration because i am not uh, familiar with this eudosima caterpillars actually to, to be frank and not an easy task to identify these eudosima caterpillars uh, easily so the very the easy caterpillar is this caterpillar to identify from this eudosima is eudosima homaena so i have included the pictures of the caterpillars so here you could see beautiful how beautifully we could see their eye spots so it's amazing to see these eye spots in the wings and it's an anti predatory uh, strat strategies so here we could see eudosima homaena so next we could just look upon zygenite family so zygenite family is very well known for the mimicry so in butterflies if we look we will uh, tell the danaenae sub family members as well as the uh, few more, few butterflies included in papilionidae family as the perfect example for the mimicry in butterflies but in the case of moths uh, zygenite is the best family where we could see many moths many moths mimicking so it comprises of brightly colored day flying moths actually the zygenidae family members include brightly colored moths and they are often day flying moths and many of them mimic a uh, distasteful butterflies many moths included in the zygenidae family uh, mimic distasteful butterflies and here is a list of the families there are four calizygenidae uh, uh, chalcosinae procrigine and zygenine whereas chalcosinae is one of the best sub families we could find where mimicry is brilliantly being depicted so here on the left side we could see cyclosia latipennis caterpillar so the caterpillar of cyclosia latipennis which is often mimicking the uh, glassy tiger butterfly which i had mentioned quite earlier and on the right side uh, we could see uh, the male of cyclosia latipennis so the males are not that much beautiful as that females so they are not involved in mimicking the glassy tiger butterfly so chalcosinae is one of the subfamily subfamilies in zygenidae family and they are often included in mimicry uh, the many moths included in the zygenidae family are often mimicking and they are also day flying so so many studies have been conducted on chalcosinae subfamily is one of the subfamily where uh, a majority of studies regarding mimicry have been carried out so here is uh, an image of the chalcosinae subfamily members mimicking others so 
here is an image and on the right side we could see an evolutionary perspective on an evolutionary perspective we could see the butterflies just in between many modes actually there is much no much difference only the difference lies in the antennae and we could see many modes of and day flyers and many butterflies but all the butterflies are actually day flyers and many of the modes we could see as day flyers and evolutionary perspective if we look uh, the butterflies are in the middle of many modes so here is a, if this is not a chalcosine member it's a, actually a procreatine uh, terracia species terracia subcorita so this is also a, a mount in the cyganidae family uh, which mimic wasp so we could just look upon co-location jamming so we may have seen or we may have fam familiarized with this co-location jamming phenomenon and it's seen uh, in between the bands as well as modes so there we could say that it's an evolutionary battle between modes as well as bands and co-location jamming is very well evident here so this ba bats as we all know they use as the ultrasonic sound for catching their prey and they when when they're emitting this uh, ultrasonic sounds uh, many modes uh, many modes um, often jam that ultrasonic sound by producing another sound or just deflecting them back way uh, so away from that of bats so we could see that's an interesting phenomenon thing here and interesting thing is that many tyco modes uh, have produced have the ability to produce ultrasonic sounds and the bats know which modes are actually harmful for them by sensing this uh, by receiving this ultrasonic sounds so uh, many other there are many other species of moths which mimic the sound produced by this uh, tiger moths that's very interesting to see so here is another such example uh, of bats the signal of bats have been deflected so here is a moon moth we are, we may have thinking of how why do these moths have long tail but uh, so it's actually these tails are for deflecting the uh, sound coming from that of bats so that's quite interesting thing so i think we have uh, come to an end of this slide so thank you all uh, for listening to my presentation so i think we could move for uh, if any anyone have any questions regarding uh, we could move on to the session yes, question and answer session okay. uh, thank you for the uh, the uh, interesting talk so the uh, now it's a uh, uh, forum is open for the questions so if you, if you are having any questions you you can unmute and ask so so if uh, yeah sir so the, uh, yeah sir uh, Oh, yeah, I don't yeah, know whether can, yeah. can you hear me, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can. Ah, uh, so I don't know, sir, whether it is a blunder question. That uh, is, yeah. is there any relation between the size of the caterpillar and the size of the moth? Any relation so, is there? Actually, the larger moths may have bigger caterpillars, so the caterpillars of larger moths would be quite uh, larger indeed. So smaller moths may have smaller caterpillars. That's only. And uh, one more doubt, that is, uh, can we say that uh, this caterpillar of this butterflies and uh, when we compare the size of the butter uh, caterpillar of butterflies and caterpillar of moths, is there any uh, connection, can we say that, uh, or any conclusion that uh, the caterpillar of butterflies is, uh, in size, it is there smaller? No, I don't think so. I don't think we can compare a moth as well as a butterfly according to their sizes, but we could say the uh, on the nature of the skin, if, uh, if a caterpillar is hairy, we could say obviously it belongs to a moth. And if a caterpillar is non-hairy, we could say obviously it could be a butterfly nor a moth. Uh, but we can't say that actually uh, uh, regarding to size, because uh, many there are moths ranging from variety of sizes, that not like the size of butterflies. So butterflies do. There are many butterflies. They are ranging from sizes. And there are too many moths which are ranging from sizes. So I don't think we can say that uh, this is a particular uh, butterfly on the size, uh, if we consider on the size, but we could say while comparing the skin, actually, 
uh, if it is hairy, it's obviously a mole. There is no butterfly which is having a hairy skin. So if uh, it's a smooth skin, uh, it could be a mole. And also, if it's a non-hairy, there are two possibilities. It could be either mole or it could be a butterfly. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a question. I typed it in the chat window. Yeah, yeah, you can ask. Uh, about the day flying moths that mimic the butterflies, but since uh, moths evolved first, so did the day flying moths uh, evolve later after butterflies evolved? So actually, I am not very clear about their evolution. So actually, I have, I also, I do have this similar kind of doubts as you all have. I am just studying. I am just a student. So just I, I had just take, looked upon the evolutionary scale. So the moths have evolved. Uh, first than the butterflies, but this mimicry it is uh, I think you know it's mimicry too is evolving in nature. Not that uh, if a particular zygote family member had evolved first and there is no changes happening on that particular mode. It's not like that. I think so. Uh, there will be changes regarding to this particular type of evolution. So they may be evolving in the course of time. So I don't think there is a change uh, in this uh, that because uh, if a moth have evolved first. And it, it is continuously evolving. Then too, it's evolving. So I think this mimicry, uh, so just uh, it's co-evolution, I think. So that means uh, when the butterfly is uh, similar, that is uh, butterfly is also there, then moth is also there. And the moth finds quite comfortable by mimicking that particular butterfly. So that particular criteria uh, have been seen in their wings. I think that is the particular, uh, that's the correct answer, I think so. But I am not very sure on that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I was just curious because uh, moths technically evolved first, right? So, uh, so is actually, the moth yeah, mimicking yeah. butterfly or butterfly mimicking <laughs> moth? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I was curious. Thank you. Hey, any other question? Sir, can I ask the one more? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is um, thinking about when we think about the flight speed of this uh, moths, that because ma ma majority of them are night uh, flight, um, moving but flying, and uh, may, some of them are day. But uh, about when we um, talk about the hummingbird hawk moth, they are moving in a high speed, I think. Yes, and yes, can yes. you say, can you say which moth can move in a speedy manner? Just uh, like our butterfly, we can say, no, they are in different mode, they are in different style, the movement is in a different style. Yes. Just like that, can we... The case I, think we could say, uh, I, I, I think we could say of day flying modes, actually, their flight. Regarding the flights, we could say about day flying modes, but uh, on the night flying modes, we actually don't know where and all they are flying, because it's at night. So. Uh, in day flying moths, I could say in day flying moths, they are very fast flyers. Actually, if we if we look at the uh, episteme species, the episteme species actually uh, they feed on the Dioscorea plants. So these episteme species uh, are very fast flyers. Actually, if you compare the speed of this day flying moth as well as butterfly, I think these day flying moths, majority of the day flying moths are very faster than that of the butterflies, especially this episteme species. Uh, in Kerala, I think so. Episteme adulatrix is there. Episteme maculatrix is there. Uh, then episteme latium argo. These three species are here in Kerala. I think episteme species, I found these episteme species are very faster in moving. Then too, uh, there could be many moths which are very fast flyers because uh, at, during the night time, uh, they need to get, uh, they are flying on the night time and when the, uh, they are in competition with the predators and they will obviously be faster enough. So I don't know actually uh, why comparing the uh, fast of these butterflies as well as moths, but I do think so. The day flying moths are more faster than that of the butterflies. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. So I think Hanisar could add up something if I had missed. Yeah. So actually, yeah. he's the uh, real expert in butterfly yeah. yeah. The uh, I think one more, any other question? I think one question from the chat. Okay. So how the mimicking eyes will deter predators? So you can answer. Sorry, sir. How, how mimicking eyes will deter predators? So that is mimicking eyes. So actually, uh, these eyes are actually an anti-predatory mechanism. So they have strategies, actually, these eyes. 
so we could say the signs are a, as a part of auto mimicry that is mimicking self part so while mimicking this part the predator may think so accidentally uh, the predator may think that the other region is actually their head so they will they may get confused which is the real head and they may pluck it so it's a probable chance uh, it's only a probability uh, because two sides are the downside with eye spot and upside with eye spot so uh, the downside eye spot is very much predominant so very clearly seen than their actual eyes so they will pluck off the uh, eyes on the hind wings on the downside and actually these wings are not necessary for this uh, but, uh, butterfly is no uh, moons actually this we doesn't need wings they doesn't need wings actually for mating just they need to take care of their abdomen their body they need to take care of their body not wings so uh, that's the very reason i think so okay so uh, any more questions so i uh, i mean uh, the, uh, i can see many the in the experts in the area so dr sachin gurule is there okay. and then sachin sir the um, the shankar raman so um, thank you for joining amuda sir the so the we have a lot of sauru bishas so sheik hussain so so any any more questions okay. so actually the uh, next next talk in the series will be given harsha is that okay so next talk in the series will be given by uh, mahesh on the uh, on friday so uh, it is on the introduction of various groups uh, groups of moths okay so uh, please do join so at the same time so 6:30 in the evening so so now the uh, i mean i uh, thank the uh, only question for this the uh, in the very informative talk on the moth mim mim mimicry okay so he has covered the various families and the uh, the yes explained it with the various examples so how the um, moths are mimicry so basically it is to say the diversity in moths and how they they are evading the predators yeah so it was a, a, a beautiful talk so hope hopefully you I mean the he could the motivate many of the uh, participants to the, uh, the watch the moths further and to they record data so uh, we uh, they thank all the uh, participants okay so all the participants for uh, taking time uh, and the joining with us in this evening so and the and we will be uh, having one or two talks more in this moth week so the next talk will be by mahesh okay so please do join so with this uh, we will be uh, uh, closing this session so And, and thank you once again so for uh, the joining with us okay. so thank you so anything else so thank you harsha so thank you chandrasekhar so yeah